Brother Mike, about blessing us, and we'll get started. Amen. All right, just a quick review. We've been away from this for a couple of weeks. Um, Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, uh, throws this uh, half-year celebration in honor of himself, and then a smaller feast uh, with just selected nobles. And at that smaller feast, he, gets his, he wants to get his wife, Vashti, out. Apparently, she was a very beautiful queen, and he wants to get her out and parade her in front of all these drunken noblemen, and she won't do it, which is scandalous in, in that culture. Uh, whatever the king says you do, you could be put to death, uh, imprisoned, so on. But anyway, she won't do it, and they uh, decide, you know, he noodles with his uh, noblemen, and what should we do about this? And they essentially say, look, if you let her get away with this, then all the women of the empire are going to not be su subject to their husbands. You, you can't let this precedent stand. You've got to do something dramatic. You've got to remove her from being queen. And so he does, and then a search goes out through all the empire for a, a new virgin queen for uh, King uh, Ahasuerus. And uh, uh, he, Esther ends up, she's a Jew, she ends up being brought into the harem, and she wins favor of the king. And that presents uh, some moral difficulty for Jewish scholars. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and we'll talk about it a little bit more today. Uh, compared with other young Israelites in exile away from home, think Joseph in Egypt, Daniel and his three friends in Babylon, Esther and Mordecai could be considered compromisers. She shed her Jewish name, which was Hadassah, uh, concealed her true identity, and morphed into the surrounding culture. And Christians do that all the time. Morally, she presents a disturbing picture in the text she didn't only survive the abduction, she made the most of it. She auditioned for the crown by being intimate with a man who was not her husband, and then, after winning the crown, she joined herself in marriage to a pagan man. Hebrews did not do this. At the same time that this was happening in Persia, Back home in Jerusalem, Ezra the priest was breaking up marriages between Hebrew men and foreign women to stop God's anger over their flagrant dis disregard for his word. Again, we are, not, we are now the covenant people of God, and the same principle applies. Second Corinthians 6 talks about the unequally yoked principle, and... Um, I think that that principle extends, certainly it applies to a marriage relationship, but ex it extends beyond that um, to any kind of serious relationship like a business partnership, probably a roommate situation. Why do you think uh, God would be so adamant about his covenant people not being unequally yoked in any type of intimate or serious relationship with a pagan, somebody outside of the covenant. Why is God so concerned about that? Yeah, yeah. Brother Mike says it's because of the negative effect that the unbelieving partner will have on the believing partner. And that, in all my years of ministry, I've seen that's the way it is that if you link up with an unbeliever in uh, a serious relationship, and that doesn't mean like uh, you play softball with an unbeliever. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about 
a deep abiding relationship that has lots of consequence. Again, like a business partnership where your world views are going to collide in the way you do business. Randy? Right. And Randy's talking about as, new create, 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 as a new creation in Christ, we have, in the big issues of life, we don't have commonality with unbelievers. We might like to both root for the Broncos, but in the way you handle sexuality, in the way we handle our money, in the way we handle our time, if you yoke up with an unbeliever, you're going to clash over that, that mentality. Suppose you're, you uh, enter into some type of business uh, partnership with an unbeliever. Uh, they're all about the money. And suppose you, as the believer, say, you know, uh, we should be closed on Sunday, and like Chick-fil-A, and let our employees go to church or be with their families. And your partner goes, no, we can make tons of money if we stay open on Sunday. You're going to butt heads. Or suppose as the, the partner in the business, you say, you know, I want to take part of our proceeds and support some Compassion International children. Do good with our money. Not just make money for ourselves, but I want to do good with it. And your partner goes, we're not doing that. I'm not giving our money away to some charity. You know, I want to live large. So there's good reason. Like Mike says, you're going to be negatively impacted, drawn away from God, and your, your, your ideology is completely different as a believer. Yes. Well, in Deuteronomy 7, God explicitly tells his people not, when you get into the promised land, or there are all these pagan nations around you, do not give your sons in marriage to those women, and do not let your daughters be married to men from pagan uh cultures. I think the Daniel and Joseph situation are a little bit different. They did not intentionally yoke up with unbelievers in that type of relationship. They worked with the pagan culture to have influence, but they didn't, like, Joseph didn't, uh, well, it's, it's complicated in, those, in, in both of those situations, but I I think when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, don't be yoked up, that, that is a command that we can work with unbelievers. You worked with unbelievers in your office for years, and you had a fruitful career, and you had influence in there. I don't think that's what God means. You were working for an employer. But if you, I think if you were to say, I want to be, start a partnership with my former employer, and we're going to be equal partners in the business, that's where I think that principle would come in that you want to think twice about that because your worldviews are so different. Um, in any event, yet God allows for our choices and, his, and he can sovereignly overrule the bad ones and accomplish redemptive good even when we make choices that run contrary to Scripture. That doesn't give us license to do whatever we want, but God is sovereign and he is much bigger than our choices. Um, we look at Esther, and again, Hebrew scholars are oftentimes very critical of Esther and Mordecai because, as we said a few weeks ago, they say, well, you can't give Esther as a, as a Hebrew virgin, into a harem of a pagan, much less marry a pagan. 
when the word got out that Ahasuerus was looking for a new queen, why didn't you, Mordecai, take her and hide her? Why didn't you make a run for it rather than allow her to be compromised? You know, so there's, there's criticism there. And how easy it is for me to look at other people's decisions, choices, size them up, thinking that I have a lock on what's going on, a lock on wisdom. Um, I am to judge behaviors. When Jesus says, don't judge lest you be judged, take the, you know, the log out of your own eye before you judge the splinter in another person's eye, he's not saying that I am not to judge certain behaviors as being sinful. But I can't know people's motivation, and I can't understand the inter internal conflict and turmoil that people are going through, like a Mordecai and an Esther. And there might come a day when we find ourselves in a situation where right and wrong aren't so easily defined. Every choice has a troubling mix of good and bad to it. Can you think of an example of how we could be put in a position as a believer where we have to make choices and the choices are not that clearly defined? There could be some good in it and there could be some bad in it. And we're put kind of on the spot. Can you think of, a, of an example? Yeah, Kimbring's an excellent one of voting. Uh, there are no perfect candidates. If, if Franklin Graham was running for president, I'd vote for him. But we don't have Franklin Graham. We have flawed candidates. And it seems to me that as, as a believer, I want to vote for whoever lines up best with biblical values, with imperfection. Um, uh, I was a Trump supporter, and Trump is a very flawed character. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, and yet he supported policies that I think best reflected biblical morality and ethics. Uh, so I went with him. Um, I, I, you bring up a good point. Voting is, is difficult. You know, there's give and take with candidates. We don't have ideal you know, people that we're voting for. That's a good one. Any, any other example of where we might be put in a situation where the choice isn't as clearly defined as good or evil as we would like? Jerry? Yes. Yeah, another really excellent example. Uh, of we, we have children, perhaps, and they grow up and they make choices, and sometimes those choices aren't exactly what we would like to see them make. And then we have decisions to make. Do we uncritically support bad decisions that they might make? Do we withdraw from them? Do we confront them and say, you know, I love you as my son or daughter, but biblically what you're doing is not correct and I can't support that? That's another place where we could be put in a, in a difficult position. Any others? My mother used to, uh, da oh, Dave. Yeah, you're talking about being put in ethical positions where it's easy to rationalize doing the wrong thing. Uh, ah, the company's got tons of money, you know, they won't miss it, that kind of thing. Um, my mother used to buy a lottery ticket, just like one. And she said, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give you and your family and give money to your church. I don't think gambling is a good idea. I don't think Scripture is supportive, supportive of the whole gambling industry, even though there's casting of lots in the Scriptures. 
Uh, the gambling industry has done a lot of damage to a lot of people in our culture, and it's corrupt, and there's a lot of thievery and graft and all that. And I used to think about it. If my mother called me one day and said, hey, I just won $150,000 in the lottery, which I personally I don't support, would I take the money? And she said, I'm going to send you $150,000. I would have taken it. <laughs> I would have taken it and said, it, my, my mother bought the ticket, not me. I'm just, no, I would have, but some people, I think, might say, no, it came from the lottery. I don't support gambling. I'm not taking it. Personally, I would have just taken it and used it for good. So, But there are those kind of grayish situations that we oftentimes find ourselves uh, put into that are not that easy. And so it was, I think, with Mordecai and Esther, if we're tempted to be hard on them. Um, let's look at, uh, let me read the end of chapter 2. Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai has commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. He's her cousin. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of Chronicles in the presence of the king. And we're going to get back to that. That's going to come into play uh, a little later. Now we get to chapter 3. This is, that, what I just read was an assassination plot against Xerxes by two of the king's eunuchs. Mordecai finds out about it. He tells Esther. Esther tells the king. The eunuchs are found out and they're hung. It's not real important right now, but later in the story it, it will be. So now chapter 3, verse 15 uh, verse 1 through 15. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the others who were with him. We don't know why Haman got elevated in status, but he did. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, through the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Um, in the Song of Solomon, Solomon, the Hebrew king, wrote about little foxes that ruin a vineyard, little problems that if you don't address them early, they become big problems. And, um, you know, Pastor Ryan was talking about Cain and Abel this morning, and uh, the little foxes got into the vineyard of Cain's life. And we don't know, Scripture is very sparse, on why he became an envious, vindictive man who would end up murdering his brother. But 
you know, we don't live, you know, uh, quality, God-driven, holy-seeking lives, and then one day roll out of bed and go, you know, I'm going to blow all this up and do a lot of, do as much evil as I can. Life doesn't work that way. What happens is we let little foxes into the vineyard, little things, and if we don't deal with them, they tend to escalate and become big things later on. So the uh, reason I mention that is in these verses we see a little thing. One Jew will not bow down to the king, to Ahasuerus. Just one Jew. It's a little thing that will lead to the toppling of a big man. Uh, in verse 6, uh, it says, But he, meaning Haman, disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, so they had made known to him the people of Mordecai. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Destroy, that Hebrew word means to wipe out, and it's used 25 times in the book of Esther. Haman will prove to be an ancient version of contemporary leaders committed to the extermination of Israel. Contemporary leaders like whom? He wants to wipe out all the Jews now, not just Mordecai. Who? Iran. Iran. If Iran could have their way, they would destroy every living Jew immediately. Who else is a contemporary version of Haman? Hitler. The, the final solution. It's the Jews who are impeding the welfare, the economic welfare and the national welfare of the Third Reich. So the, the solution, eliminate all the Jews. Any other examples? You remember Arafat, Yasser Arafat of the PLO? His life's ambition was to see Israel driven into the sea and Palestine taking over the promised land. Uh, how about uh, Assad of Syria, Jew hater? How about, <clears throat> you mentioned Iran Khomeini and his gang. Um, what insight into Mordecai's character uh, comes out of the verses that I just read? On the one hand, scholars are a little critical of Mordecai, in, in the way he perhaps handled his cousin Esther, what do you see about him in just those verses I read? Yeah, he's unwavering uh, in his uh, unwillingness or refusal to bow down to uh, King Xerxes. The Jews, they bow down to their own kings. They bow down to their own kings what would be the difference? Uh, in Israel, you bowed to the king. You bowed to David. You bowed to Solomon. But here in Persia, bowing to the king is a whole different ball game. Do you know what would be the difference? He's godless, for one thing, and there's another aspect to it. As God. So for Mordecai to bow to, to Xerxes, he is saying, in a sense, I recognize you as God. And to a Jew, that's blasphemy, that's anathema. You don't do that. You'd rather die than bow down to someone who claims to be God. You can treat the king with reverence and respect, but you don't bow down to him. Uh, Mordecai ends up being a, a grudge keeper. He's an Agagite, which means he is a descendant of King Agag. Do you remember anything about him? Haman, I'm sorry. Haman is an Agagite, a descendant of King Agag. Does anybody remember anything about him? The Lord commanded Saul to kill all the uh, Agagites. Agag was the, was, the, was the leader. He spared him. And 
Saul, uh, Samuel shows up on the scene and says, how come he's alive? And Samuel takes the sword and kills Agag, the king of the Agagites. And now, all this time later, Haman hates the Jews because of that incident. So he is a grudge keeper all, all this time. Um, this is a little bit off the subject, but he is, he, he is a small man. He doesn't forgive the Jews. Uh, much time has passed, and here he is ver an, in an elevated position in, in the land of Persia, and yet he cannot get past what happened between his ancestor Agag and Samuel the prophet. Um, so what I wanted to ask, this is important for us, how can I as a covenant person uh, under the new covenant be big in the face of hurts, betrayals, disappointments, uh, and we all have them. We're all hurt by other people, we're all, everybody in this room has been betrayed by somebody in their life. Uh, somebody may be very important to them, maybe somebody on the peripheral, and chances are that we uh, have betrayed somebody, a friendship, a relationship. Uh, how do I be big in the face of that kind of hurt or betrayal? Not an easy sell sometime, though, is it? To try to extend the same grace that God has shown me in Jesus to people that have betrayed and hurt me. Uh, For you, Yeah, and forgiveness, lack of forgiveness carries an enormous price to us, spiritually as well as emotionally, psychologically, physically. Uh, I had an aunt, my father's sister, who, whose uh, son-in-law betrayed her daughter in marriage and ran off with one of her daughter's friends, moved out to California from New Jersey back in the 1960s, and my aunt was so vindictive, more vindictive than her daughter who was betrayed by her husband. My, but the mother, my, my aunt, actually hired a private detective out in California to try to f hunt this guy down and find some kind of dirt on him to like ruin his life because he had left her daughter. So she held on to that, that betrayal, that pain, that unfairness, and she eventually, in the 1970s, came up with stomach cancer, died horribly. And doctors, psychologists will tell you that when you don't forgive, when you let that anger, that hatred fester inside you for long periods of time, it can destroy you internally. Um, now, I don't know if the, the stomach cancer, you know how your stomach gets when you, like, don't like people or when you're around people, you know, you, you, know, you know what I mean. And I think over time that can, can adversely affect us. It seemed to do that with my aunt. So uh, confession of any wrong vindictive spirit, Jesus says, love your enemies. You, you heard it was said to hate your enemies, but I tell you, love them and do good to those who hurt you. Let, leave justice and vindication with your Father in heaven. Um, Gandhi was vilified by the press when he was trying peaceably to gain independence uh, from Britain, from uh, Great Britain for, uh, for India. And, one, and he was always very forgiving of people that would slander him constantly. And a reporter said, you know, how come you are so willing to forgive these people that are so viciously critical of you? And Gandhi said... He said, how can I, who stand in such need of God's forgiveness, 
not turn around and forgive people that have hurt me. And Gandhi wasn't a believer, but he was intrigued. He loved the teaching of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, even though he could not accept the fact of Jesus' divinity, and he never, as far as we know, humbled himself and became a believer. Um, love my enemies, pray for them, and do it. Be honest with God, and if there's somebody that's hurt you and betrayed you, it, it's just it's good to say to God, I don't want to pray for this person. It's hard for me to pray for them. I want to do it authentically, but I'm not there yet. Help me to get there. Be honest with God. Be authentic about it. Let's get back to, to um, Mordecai's refusal to bow down to Xerxes. And all he risks, he obviously could have been imprisoned. He could have been executed. They seem to be a little tolerant of him to see if he would come around within a little bit of time, but he wouldn't waver. He wouldn't budge until he gets Haman's attention. So how does my culture right now encourage me, the believer, to bow down to contemporary gods and idols? My culture is always pressuring me, either overtly or covertly, to bow down to the idols of culture. How does it do that? Yeah, the cancel culture. If you don't have the right position on every issue, you get canceled. They look to destroy your career, uh, destroy your reputation. If you don't exactly line up with the ultra-liberal, radical, woke culture, and it's gotten so bad that Hollywood, like extreme godless liberal Hollywood types are resisting that culture because it's so out of control. But you feel that, depending on the environment you are in, you'll feel that pressure to conform, to bow down to the idols of same-sex marriage, you know, uh, you know, abortion on demand, right up to uh, the time of giving birth. You've got to bow down to all these positions. Um, you know, Yeah, it sounds good. Like, gee, are, are, shouldn't we all have a free choice in what we do with our bodies? Um, Paul doesn't seem to think so when he says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that we, we don't have free reign. And we use euphemisms a lot in our culture. Euphemisms are pleasant ways of saying ugly things. Like, instead of a graveyard, we say, well, it's a memorial park it sounds a lot better. And so instead of uh, the, the taking of a child's life, it's the elimination of unwanted fetal tissue. That's a euphemism. But doesn't it sound good to say, well, we want to preserve a woman's right over her reproductive organs. Gee, that sounds pleasant. Instead, what you're really saying is we want women to be able to take the lives of unborn children that are God-given, and that child is, life or death is not the right of, of a mother. It's God-given. Anyway, it's a whole expansive situation, but the pressure is constantly on us to morph into that acceptance. Randy? Yeah, Randy's talking about smoke and mirrors. Uh, there's a lot of like end runs and tricky language in the whole abortion culture. The same with the LBGTQ and the same-sex marriage situation.
Yeah, and we always are advocating rights for women in the whole abortion field, but we don't talk so much about the rights of a God-given life in the womb. And we also don't talk much, you don't hear very much about all the residual negatives that come through abortion that uh, if you will talk to many women who have had abortions, how spiritually and psychologically damaged they have been. Now, in uh, we've also had, we've had women here at Foothills Fellowship that have had abortions, have come to faith in Christ, and the guilt of that has been taken away, and they're set free to move on to healthy relationships and healthy, uh, you know, uh, experiences with their husbands and, you know, just life and community. We don't have to stay stuck, but you don't hear that in the abortion industry. There is, it's all like, it's wonderful. If you have an unwanted pregnancy, everything is going to be glorious. And the truth is very often very far from that. Dave? Uh, Dave brings up the uh, cancel culture with the pillow guy, Mike Lindell, and also with our friend, the baker over here, Jack Phillips. And uh, because Jack Phillips is a believer and holds to biblical principles on the sacredness of marriage, uh, there were people and still are people that want to take away his right to make a living. They're not content to just say, no, we don't agree with you, Mr. Phillips. We think you should make the cake for a gay wedding. They're not content with that. They want to go after him and vilify him and destroy his ability to f provide for his family. They want to totally cancel him. Because of the agenda. Your, your answer is too reasonable. <laughs> just go to another bakery, you know. Uh, that's all you have to do if you don't agree with them. Uh, how does my culture encourage me to bow down to contemporary gods? The pressure of my peers, family, co-workers. Uh, why would you go to church on Sunday when you can do stuff with extended family? Why would you take a whole Sunday morning? You only get Saturday and Sunday off. Why don't you do it? Do stuff with us. Uh, the pull of material advancement and hoarding, sensual saturation, gender confusion, no moral boundaries. All roads lead equally to God. Don't be narrow. Accept all faith claims as being true. Uh, these and many other ways, some of them we just talked about, are ways that uh, our culture constantly pressures us to bow down to um, the false gods, the false kings that set them, themselves up as God. Uh, it, depending, again, on the environment you in, you're in, you will feel this pressure more or less. Randy, I know you, know you as a detective, Evan, you as a sheriff, you know, you'll feel that pressure, you know, uh, the whole woke thing, the, co the correctness. You know, the trick is to be a good employee, to be respectful of authority, to work within the confines of your departments, but yet, as a Christian, honor God in the way you do your work. That's not an easy thing, I would think. And some of you guys have been in the business world, high-tech world. Uh, it's, it's certainly not going to get better. It just becomes more and more uh, uh, intimidating towards believers. Remember, in the whole woke mentality, the worst person you can be on earth is a white male evangelical. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, you are at the very bottom of the totem pole. You are the problem. If, if we can only get rid of you, we can move into a new state of enlightenment and nirvana within our culture. So before we wrap up, um, again, Mordecai didn't suddenly gain the strength 
take this kind of stand that could have cost him his life very easily. He didn't get this overnight. How do you prepare yourself to be a Mordecai when that pressure comes? And it comes, and it's going to come more and more within our culture. Mike says it helps to prepare yourself for these moments uh, Dallas Willard was a he passed away recently he wrote excellent uh, devotional pastoral discipleship type material and he said that and he was talking about the spiritual disciplines that you just mentioned sharing your faith giving serving praying worshiping studying scripture he said a lot of Christians are like a pinch hitter called up to bat in a critical situation uh, and if the pinch hitter hasn't been in the tunnel taking lots of swings lots of batting practice you get up to bat and it's intimidating and overwhelming you strike out and you let your team down he said a lot of Christians are like that we get to a, a, a moment of crisis in our lives and instead of being Mordecai we completely unravel melt implode because we haven't put in the time in the batting cage. You know, we're not ready. Uh, and Jesus talks exactly about exactly what Mike brought up when he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's two builders, wise and foolish. Storms are going to come into your life. He doesn't say if they come. He says when they come. The guy who builds his house on sand is like the little piggy who didn't build his house well and bad wolf comes along and blows it down. The other builds his, his life on the rock of God's truth through the spiritual disciplines. And there's a little saying that says you better thatch your roof before the rains come. Once the rain starts, it's too late to get up on your roof and go, you know, I should have done this on a sunny day. It's too late. Your house is going to get washed away. And crisis comes to us, unemployment, betrayal, sickness, persecution, loss uh, all kinds of ways and if our roof is not thatched like Mordecai's was he would have just gone like oh, maybe I better bow down I you know I don't want to get killed I don't want to get thrown into prison and he would have just compromised and that's what a lot of Christians do under the gun is they wilt no Yeah, I mean, there's got to be something wrong with us if we look for persecution and trouble. You know, nowhere are we encouraged to do that. You know, Daniel ended up in Babylon. He didn't want to be there. Mordecai would have rather been in Jerusalem, but he was taken away into captivity. Joseph certainly didn't want to be in an Egyptian prison. He'd rather be with his family back in, in Palestine. But sometimes life throws us a curve, and there we are. Kim Brockman doesn't want to be, you know, having three surgeries in St. Anthony's Hospital and facing rigorous PT and rehab and then home care. She doesn't want that. But sometimes that's what life brings us. And the more prepared we are, as Mordecai was, the better we're going to handle those crises, whatever those crises look like. Let's stop there and we'll pick up next week as the plot thickens. So speaking of Kim, we should pray for her. She's in St. Anthony's. I suspect she'll be there for a little bit. Um, anybody have any contact with the Becketts lately? Uh, Dave? Yeah, and for people like the Becketts, we've said this before, they are church people. I mean, in all my years of ministry here, some of the time they came, 
they hardly ever miss. They love to be in church worshiping with God's people. So this has to be brutally hard for them. Randy, you had contact? Give us a quick update on Maxine. She's in a rehab center. These are all little touches and reminders of mortality. All right, let me pray for us, then I'll let you scoot. Father, we bow down to you only as the true God of all eternity, the God without beginning, without end, omnipotent, omnipresent, God full of grace and truth and mercy and justice and kindness, God who loves his covenant people with a love that will not let go. We ask, Father, for the grace to thatch our roofs well, so that when the day of crisis comes that we will not see our house blown down but it will weather the storm for your glory so I ask for healing in the congregation and encouragement and patience as people need to recover and help us to do our job as the body of Jesus and reaching out to people that need encouragement need prayer need visits help us to do our job well so we love you, we worship you, forgive our sins, bless the rest of our day and our week in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody. You're dismissed.